One claims it's the company's only chance for survival. Atari has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The 31 year old. EWA presents the difference. Kodak is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to the 22nd episode of Bankrupt. There's a good chance that you've either been to or driven by a Six Flags amusement park. Their presence across the United States has been enormous, outpacing other theme park operators like Disney, Universal, and Cedar Fair in the number of rides and park acreage. In fact, it was the largest theme park operator in the whole world, with many of its parks beloved by fans. But unlike all of those other companies, Six Flags has been dealing with financial difficulties for decades, and has seemingly always been through a revolving door of corporate owners making terrible decisions. There was even a time where that financial pressure became too severe and they declared bankruptcy altogether, leaving behind full theme parks abandoned or demolishing them in their wake. So let's take a look at the history behind this colossal amusement park company, figure out why they've been struggling for so long, and find out where they're going, especially given the headline-grabbing merger with their once fierce competitor. This is Six Flags. This episode of Bankrupt is sponsored by Incogni. Use code BRIGHTSUN at the link below to get an exclusive 60% off an annual plan. In 1955, Walt Disney and his company opened Disneyland in Anaheim, California, arguably one of the world's first theme parks. It was obviously a massive success, and it showed how popular and profitable an amusement park enterprise like this can be. So, its success inspired developers to replicate this type of development project in other places. One of those would-be developers was a man named Angus Wynn, a 47-year-old Texas-based businessman who mainly developed large-scale residential properties. Wynn and his associates were looking for ways to finance a new industrial park, and seeing the success of Disneyland over in California, well, he thought that building his own theme park might be the revenue generator that he needed to see through his other projects. So with a site selected just west of Dallas in Arlington, Texas, Wynn built Six Flags Over Texas, which opened in August of 1961. It was a humble little park, and it shared a lot in common with Disneyland, both in shape, its layout, divided lands, themed attractions, and even a train running the perimeter. Those lands were divided into six different nations that held sovereignty over the state of Texas. Flags for each of those governors flew over the park, and that's where Six Flags got its name. The park was a big hit, and several hundreds of thousands of people flocked to it. In fact, it was much more of a hit than originally anticipated. Seeing it as a close-by, more affordable alternative to Disneyland, along with its own roster of fun attractions, it was a no-brainer for many locals. So with all of this interest and a huge amount of cash coming through the door, Wynn had an epiphany. Maybe instead of running an amusement park for a couple of years just to build an industrial development over it, he thought, maybe the park could be its own long-term business in of itself. So he continued to expand the park with new rides and creating even more appeal, which in turn saw an ever-growing attendance. And this wasn't just a lazy attempt either. They were investing in new attractions that were designed to excite guests, like introducing the world's first log flume ride, and an advanced steel mine train coaster being one of the first in America. But Angus Wynn ultimately was not the person suited for the theme park business, and in 1966 he decided to cash out and sold Six Flags to the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, which acquired the controlling shares. With a new deep-pocketed parent corporation, they quickly sought out to expand even further, opening another park called Six Flags over Georgia a year later. With even more investors coming in and taking larger ownership stakes, yet another park was built and opened in 1971, this one just outside of St. Louis called Six Flags over Mid-America. These were all popular parks, and the company wanted to continue their expansion efforts even further. However, their strategy going forward was not to put up a bunch of capital to construct brand new properties. No, they would instead buy out existing parks. This is basically the guiding growth philosophy for Six Flags going forward. 
Egypt. And they first did this in 1975 with Astroworld in Houston, Texas. They continued on with Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey, and Magic Mountain in Valencia, California. All three of these parks were independent properties which had all been opened within the last 11 years. This all capped off a successful growth period for Six Flags through the 1970s and encouraged management to keep going. Though, on that note, consistent management was never really a thing for the Six Flags Corporation. New majority shareholders would take over like a revolving door, most of them with absolutely no experience in the theme park business, and we already saw this with Penn Central. This trend continued with the Bally Manufacturing Corporation in 1982. They purchased the controlling shares of Six Flags from Penn Central for just a little over $147 million. Really, a pretty small purchase price for a company that analysts estimated was making around $310 million with a $35 million profit. And the company didn't sit still. They kept innovating from here, opening the world's first water rapid ride in Astroworld, and opened Six Flags Great America north of Chicago. They were also now experimenting with characters in their parks, as they had just acquired the theme park rights for the Looney Tunes characters. This was a great way to appeal to families and better compete with Disney, which by this point had a massive property in Central Florida with two major theme parks and a third on the way. But Bally wouldn't hold on to the company for too much longer, as a private equity firm, Restway Capital Corporation, had purchased the company for $617 million through a leveraged buyout. This was in 1987, and it showed how valuable the Six Flags brand was becoming, seeing a $470 million valuation increase in just five years. Six Flags was offering quality thrills in a clean, inviting, and amusement-filled environment that was both cheaper than Disney and closer to home. Six Flags parks weren't necessarily something their guests would fly or travel long distances to go to, but they were comfortable and fun environments for those who didn't want to or couldn't afford to commit to traveling all the way to Disney. They were regional theme parks. In fact, Six Flags was now the largest chain in terms of size in the whole country, seeing over 17 million combined guests with revenue of around $400 million. Industry titan Time Warner wanted a piece of it, and they were now buying up shares, becoming a large shareholder for the company, which further strengthened their partnership with Warner Brothers and the Looney Tunes brand. It was now in their best interest for the company to succeed, and Six Flags Parks began holding Looney Tunes-themed events. The company would continue to open new attractions across their portfolio, including some larger roller coasters like Ultra Twister and Astroworld, Viper at Magic Mountain, and Texas Giant the world's tallest wooden roller coaster, which opened in Six Flags Over Texas. This also cemented the brand as a place for theme park firsts, a utopia for a mature crowd ready to indulge in serious thrills. One of the only ways to do so in all of America, but especially if you were local to one of these parks. Though, once again, the company would change hands, this time being split between three major shareholders. Two investment firms owning a combined 50%, and Time Warner owning the other half. While Six Flags was growing and looked like a stable brand, the truth was, it was riddled with high interest debt and had a little cash in reserve. The company also had some duds. Through the 70s, they owned a few wax museums, one even being in Orlando, Florida. Then there was Six Flags Atlantis, where they had purchased a half-finished water park in Hollywood, Florida. It only lasted for nine years. Then there was the extremely disastrous Auto World in Flint, Michigan. It cost $70 million to build and only lasted for six months before switching to seasonal openings, then being demolished altogether ten years later. There was also Six Flags Flags Power Plants, an actually really neat and creative attempt at an indoor theme park that was located in Baltimore. It too would only last a few years. The point is, Six Flags didn't always get it right, and all of this debt was weighing down what could be a very profitable company ripe for growth. So when this new deal went down, these massive investment firms, along with Warner, added investment to the parks as well as a lot of safety net cash to keep them afloat. The newly formed Six Flags Theme Parks Inc. was a brand new entity, and once again hungry for growth. Warner had already invested $200 million into the brand and the company introduced a few new popular attractions through the early 90s, such as the Right Stuff Mach 1 Simulator Ride, Z-Force, as well as the very popular and technologically advanced Batman the Ride. 
But it wasn't just thrills, as the company opened other attractions and even a water park across the highway from Six Flags over Texas. All of this was driving an attractive proposition for potential theme park guests, drawing them in with really good marketing and a genuinely good portfolio of rides and attractions. This was also a time where Six Flags had now become a culturally significant brand, with their parks very popular with young adults and even celebrities, hosting star-studded events or even birthday parties, many of which at Magic Mountain. In 1993, Time Warner would ultimately opt to buy out the other investors and take 100% control over the company, bringing it under their own corporate umbrella. Across all of their parks, combined annual attendance was now an impressive 22 million people. Two years later though, in 1995, Time Warner apparently decided to give up full control and sell 51% of their shares to an investment company and spin it off as its own corporation. By doing this, Time Warner would leave a lot of their own corporate debt with the departing company. This change in leadership would only last a few years and see some minor changes. By now it was 1998 and Six Flags was in the crosshairs of yet another potential corporate takeover. This time, it was Premier Parks. Premier, formerly known as the Chirico Group, was a large real estate development company which, like Six Flags, pivoted into an amusement park company after it had great success in acquiring other small theme parks. By the 1990s, they were hungry, buying up other entertainment companies and acquiring large theme park assets like Darien Lake, Riverside Park, and Geauga Lake. They were looking to grow and loved the brand Six Flags had built. So, very much not an April Fool's joke, Premier Parks had acquired Six Flags on April 1st, 1998 for $1.8 billion. But this deal had a lot of risk to it. It was the largest acquisition deal in theme park history, and Premier would put up over $700 million in cash, though they would also take out over $800 million in debt. They were gambling it all on the prospect that Six Flags would generate enough cash to pay it off in the future, and this was already on top of the decades of existing debt the company was saddled with. But this deal also meant that Six Flags would be taking on a sizable portfolio of amusement parks that Premier already owned. And over the next couple of years, many of those parks would be slowly rebranded into Six Flags. Geauga Lake would become Six Flags Ohio, New Marine World would become Six Flags Marine World, and Kentucky Kingdom would become Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. This is just to name a few. The company had more than doubled in size, and Premier had gone all in on the Six Flags brand, dissolving their own name, operating it all under Six Flags Theme Parks Inc. Though executives from Premier believed that the company needed some fixing, as they thought past owners had not provided enough capital for new attractions and didn't market enough to families. They were also making efforts outside of America, now expanding with Six Flags Mexico, a park in Montreal, Canada, and even overseas with Six Flags Holland. By 2001, they also grew their Six Flags Ohio Park after acquiring the SeaWorld across the lake turning it into one massive property. In fact, it became the largest theme park in the world, though a costly one to operate. New rides were opening across the chain, as well as some notable coasters like Goliath at Magic Mountain, the longest and fastest closed circuit coaster in the world, the unique Superman Krypton Coaster, a floorless coaster at Fiesta Texas, Superman Ride of Steel at Six Flags America, Nitro at Great America, being regarded as one of the best roller coasters in the whole world, and Superman El Ultimo Escape, the tallest and fastest coaster in Latin America. These were all innovative and record-breaking attractions, and there were many more that opened during this time. Six Flags was also now doing Fright Fest as well as Winter Lights, all seasonal events that were very popular. Six Flags New Orleans was brought on during this time, and really the whole company seemed to have injected a lot of excitement into the brand. It was truly a great time to be an amusement park fan. And I remember visiting Darien Lake as a kid at this point, and absolutely having a blast. In terms of national brand name recognition, Six Flags is right up there with, and even edging out Disney. In a recent study, Six Flags scored higher than even Disney World, SeaWorld, and Disneyland in aided awareness. And Six Flags even edged both Disney parks as the favorite theme park. But despite all of the excitement around these investments, the company's financial situation was not looking great. Six Flags had continued to spend so much money on both in-park growth and external growth 
buying all sorts of independent theme parks around the world. Now that would be fine if they had tons of cash and reserves, and had a robust business plan on how all of these new acquisitions would benefit the company. Remember, Six Flags was making all of these growth investments while still having a lot of debt that they were paying off. But at the same time, they weren't paying that debt off because they were in negative cash flow since their acquisition. And they were making all of these growth investments under the assumption that nothing would go catastrophically wrong. Following the events of September 11th, 2001, tourism declined dramatically. The company's stock took a beating and attendance dropped off. Not great for the largest theme park operator in the world that was responsible for 37 parks and 47,000 seasonal and full-time employees. Meanwhile, during this downturn, billionaire Dan Snyder began buying stock in Six Flags, quickly becoming a major shareholder. But even with his financial help, Six Flags found themselves in a very poor financial situation. After years of capital expenditure in the form of growth and in-park investments, as well as the massive amount of debt Premier took out to buy the company, Six Flags continued to have one bad season after another in terms of attendance. Their year-over-year -year sales were stagnant, and even declining, with their net losses mounting. By 2004, the company had lost over $460 million. But that wasn't even the worst part. Worse was that the company was in over $2.3 billion in debt, and they were making enormous monthly interest and debt payments. So instead of continuing the trend of growth, they instead began to downsize. They sold their largest theme park in the world, Six Flags Worlds of Adventure, to their fierce rival, Cedar Fair. They also sold off all but one of their European parks, all of which had just been rebranded to Six Flags a few years prior. Now, these sales did contribute to the company's goal of paying down that debt. But the dire straits wouldn't end here. Investors, mainly the two largest shareholders, including Dan Snyder, were not satisfied about the company's current tracks, and they started a proxy war within the company, demanding change and seats for themselves on the board. Dan Snyder's company Red Zone ultimately got their way, instituting sweeping changes with a new board of directors and a new CEO. But the company was still in a bad position. In 2005, Six Flags New Orleans had just been hit by Hurricane Katrina, essentially destroying the entire park. That was obviously a whole other story in of itself that I made an entire documentary on. You can of course stream it on a few different platforms, including Amazon Prime Video. Six Flags was not in a position to save the park, and it was ultimately left abandoned, as was Astroworld in Houston, Texas. Despite it ranking as one of the highest attended parks in the chain, Six Flags decided it would be more cost-effective to close the park permanently and just demolish it. Six Flags ultimately sold the land for $77 million in 2006, but that was only after they spent $20 million to just demolish it. The new corporate strategy was to focus on families and away from teens and adults. Though that was a little hard as they had already spent millions building headlining attractions for that demographic. Overall, a higher emphasis would be put on customer service and cleaning up their parks, which over the last few years had declined quite significantly. At least they had some truly sensational marketing during this time. Still though, the company would continue to sell off their properties. But this did little to deter what many saw was an inevitability. Six Flags even stated in their 2008 annual report that, quote, There is substantial doubt about our ability to continue as a going concern unless a successful restructuring occurs. They go on to say that there is a high likelihood that the company would file for Chapter 11, as they ended the year with a little over a billion dollars in revenue, though posted a $112 million loss. As their stock price sank to under a dollar, where Six Flags would be delisted from the New York Stock Exchange, and with the recession weighing heavily on their consumer base, the company was in a critical point. After failing to make debt payments on June 13th, 2009, Six Flags had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. At the time, Six Flags was in a little over $2.4 billion worth of debt. The company quickly announced they would restructure in hopes of emerging as a brand that would actually make money, and the first line of action was to drop their lease for Kentucky Kingdom. By April of 2010, a judge approved the company's new plan, with new investors coming in and providing cash, while Dan Snyder was ousted from the board. Their stock would be relisted on the New York Stock Exchange at around $9. 
dollars. This new cash from investors would pay off around a billion dollars worth of their existing debt. Definitely a better place to start from. So with a new plan for the future to cater more to the family market, the company officially emerged from bankruptcy on May 3rd of that year. Things were actually looking good for the company after this too. Six Flags now had 19 parks across North America, and by 2014, revenue had consistently increased to $1.1 billion. And that year, they actually made a profit. As a result, their stock was up too, climbing 300% since they were relisted. Once again though, management thought it would be best to start expanding. After all, it wouldn't be corporate America without the prospect of infinite growth, right? The company signed a deal with a development partner to build Six Flags parks in China. In fact, the company was planning a significant presence overseas, planning up to 10 parks in China, a water park in Vietnam, along with a park that was in various stages of development in Dubai. This would be Six Flags' growth strategy moving forward almost entirely international, because that worked so well the first time. Domestically, well, they would see little growth aside from a leasing agreement for Frontier City and Darien Lake in 2018, plus a few watermarks. But revenue domestically was pretty solid, with a healthy net income and 20% margins in 2017. But this was also in part due to the lack of an investment in their parks. Fans were beginning to get annoyed at how many of the new offerings seemed to lack innovation and vision. They were often all IP-based, off-the-shelf rides. In fairness though, they did clean up some of their parks and invest in some new and well-received attractions like Twisted Colossus, Max Force, and the Joker. While their stock price rose, the company then decided it would be a good idea to try and buy their competitor, Cedar Fair. Yeah, except they didn't have nearly enough money to commit to their $4 billion bid, instead offering the majority of it in the form of Six Flags stock. Cedar Fair, of course, turned this offer down. It was a very strange move, and this corporate mentality seemed to favor shareholders and stock value above everything else. By 2019, attendance and revenue only climbed 2%, while in-park spending, sponsorships, and net income all had fallen. As a result, their stock took a massive hit, the largest single drop in recent Six Flags history. The new parks that were recently brought on ultimately did little to bolster their revenue, and by early 2020, it was announced that not only was the Dubai park now cancelled, but so was their entire future plans for a China expansion. Ten parks being planned, all with a strategic partner, all dead, and the company would just eat those losses. Though that was probably the smart move, as 2020 would prove to be a perilous year for the company. Like all physical entertainment around the world, Six Flags was forced to shut their parks temporarily, and as a result, saw a massive decline in park attendance. By the end of the year, they had posted a net loss of over $423 million. Though attendance and revenue did rebound by 2021, the same year the board elected a new CEO, Salim Basul. He began instituting new cost-cutting measures company-wide and the lack of new attractions would only get worse, all while they raised prices and cut jobs. What really infuriated fans during this time, aside from $45 regular parking, was the future outlook by their CEO on what Six Flags could become. See, they wanted Six Flags to be a premium, family-friendly focused experience. Executives believed that Six Flags was remarkably undervaluing itself in terms of tickets and season pass prices, and to be fair, there is some truth to that. So those prices went up, but they did so without adding anything of substantial value. Focus was put on seasonal events, something corporate could easily throw together instead of actual rides, which is what most critics claimed would be the actual way to bring back their fans. And I mean, it makes sense. It's pretty risky to raise the price for a product significantly while giving the same experience. Six Flags was not anywhere near a premium Disney or Universal-like product, and the result of this was pretty devastating. Between 2021 and 2022, attendance across all of their parks fell 26% from 27 million in 2021 to just 20 million in 2022. As a result, revenue and net income fell too, 9% and 16% respectively. And once again, Six Flags' debt creeped back up 
to $2.3 billion. This was a brutal decline, as it showed fans were not returning like executives had hoped, and Six Flags would continue their streak of entertainment and financial underperformance. Remember, this was a time where most people should have been going out to theme parks. It's after the pandemic, and people were eager to get out. For comparison, Cedar Fair had an overall attendance of 19.4 million people in 2021, but they saw a massive increase to nearly 27 million guests in 2022. And this was all while Cedar Fair has four less parks, so Six Flags' numbers were just completely backwards. Clearly, turning Six Flags into a premium destination without giving the parks anything tangibly premium was a complete miss, and once again, the company was struggling to figure out what the path forward would look like. 2023 was shaping out to be another rough year for the company, with attendance and in-park spending down across the board. With little new attractions to show for, many didn't see any reason to return to a Six Flags park, especially since it was so much more expensive. The company was in a declining situation, one which had brought its overall market valuation down. Down to a point, in fact, where a merger was possible. In a move almost nobody saw coming, on November 2nd, 2023, it was announced that Cedar Fair, Six Flags' longtime competitor, were going to join forces and merge the two companies. It was marketed as a merger of equals, bringing the two regional theme park giants together as one $8 billion company. Cedar Fair and its investors were going to have controlling shares over the company, owning 51% with their CEO staying on in the role. Six Flags would retain 49%, and their CEO would be elected to chairman of the board. This merger would retain the Six Flags name, and while it did seem to come out of nowhere, it's clear Cedar Fair saw that Six Flags was struggling. By combining forces, they would now have a good grasp on most markets across North America, bringing their total number of parks to 27 with an additional 15 water parks. By combining corporate oversight too, they claim that they could save around $120 million in two years. It'll also free up over $800 million in cash flow, which they could then presumably reinvest into Six Flags parks and bring them up to a higher standard that Cedar Fair parks had been enjoying for years. Perhaps then, they can make the existing Six Flags parks both profit centers for the company and parks that are, once again, attractive to fans. This is not important, but why did they have to use AI for the photos on the covers for their merger investor booklet? Were they seriously short of amusement park file photos? This looks terrible. Obviously, the road to get to this point for Six Flags has been, I want to say a disaster, but that sounds a bit harsh. Let's call it an unmitigated mess filled with terrible decisions that ultimately led to a maybe positive ending. But it's been a long and tumultuous road to get here, with billions of dollars lost, bridges with their customers being burned, and several parks being lost, either on the drawing board or just lost to time. Even from the very start, Six Flags was never meant to be a long-term company. It was created as a profit center so a businessman could just replace it with an industrial park. But even when it proved to be more than just a fad, the company would never stay with one owner for long. Executives and major shareholders would continuously swap in and out, a never-ending series of buyouts and new management. While Six Flags did do a lot right and did innovate and build genuinely great regional parks, they also made a ton of terrible decisions that always seemed to lose more and more money. From the excessive and costly expansion plans, to the loans taken out to acquire the company, to the lack of investment later, Six Flags has just been an exhausting company to keep up with. And I'm sure there's so much more that I'm missing here. But all of this led to the largest theme park operator in the world, and one of the most recognizable names in entertainment, to ultimately declare bankruptcy. But now there is hope for the future, as capable executives are now at the helm, and maybe that chapter of the tumultuous days for the company are now over. And maybe the future of Six Flags might actually have a happy ending. So as we know, 2021 wasn't a great year for Six Flags, and on top of all of their financial pressure, a court ruling made them pay $36 million for the use of a fingerprint scanner at Great America. That just illustrates how often your own data is being sourced and collected in places you'd never think. That's why I'm really happy about this video's sponsor, Incogni. There's really no way of getting around your data constantly being collected every time you use the internet. 
it, and it's often collected by various websites and sold through data brokers. It's a troubling process, and it's likely why I receive spam emails and robo phone calls. It's actually almost definitely why, and it's probably why you have similar experiences. But handling and deleting that data all by yourself is a fruitless and very difficult venture. So thankfully, there's Incogni. They simplify the process and essentially do it all for you. All you need to do is sign up, grant them legal access to remove your information, and watch the process. They take care of all removal requests, objections, and give you the peace of mind that your information isn't out there being sold to financially benefit others, and it will also help reduce the frequency you get those scam messages. Really, it's a great service that makes security simple, and for the price, you really can't go wrong. Especially when you use the code BRIGHTSUN at the link below, which will get you an exclusive 60% off an annual plan. We're also now at the end of a long year, and there is has been so much that I've gotten to do, all because you watch my videos. So it truly, genuinely means the world to me. So thank you so much for a great year here on YouTube, and thanks for voting for this topic. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on another video or another poll. But most importantly, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.